happy to be here. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, uh, I am from the University of Kentucky. Thank you for the invitation. Um, a little bit about me. I'm actually from the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Born and raised. A few counties over Caroline County. Uh, lived in Fettlesburg for my entire young life and then uh, went to college, University of Kentucky and never left. So I did a stint in industry after I got my degrees. Um, did work in southern United States, Brazil with a large energy company um, and now back doing what I love and that's helping farmers and getting out here able to talk to you. And so this topic actually got started about two years ago from a simple question that I got from a farmer in your area. I'm going to call him my adopted grandfather. He's my best friend's grandfather. Um, and he uh, emailed me and said, Jordan, what's the deal with these carbon markets? And as a traditional extension person, right, one question you kind of just brush off, right? But when the floodgates open and multiple farmers across the United States are calling me and asking about carbon markets, I think, well, I better look into this and try to figure things out. So since then, I've been blessed to probably talk to over, I don't know, 5,000 farmers and stakeholders, not only in Kentucky, but across the U.S. and internationally on this issue. I uh, just flew in from Kansas, the other K state, that I won't talk about, to talk to some lend, uh, ag lenders out there um, about this topic as well. So it's been a very hot button issue. So who here has heard of carbon markets before, right? A lot of popular press articles out there on that, right? Who here can tell me what, it, what they are? <laughs> Good, see, this is why I get invited to come speak to people, right? So this is what it's all about. So you'll he see here the topics that I'll be discussing with you this morning. Now, um, as any good extension professional does, once something doesn't go over right the first time, you gotta make some changes, right, to a presentation. And that's why I put this little picture up here. Anybody remember this movie called Used Cars? Yeah. Right? I am not here, okay, to sell you on carbon markets, okay? That is not my job. My job is to put myself in your shoes as a farmer and look at these carbon markets through the lens of an economist, okay? So that's what I'm coming at you with, not environmental, not policy regulation, but through the lens of an economist, okay? So we'll address those topics up here for you, but we'll start off with what is driving carbon markets today in the United States, okay? There's two broad categories when we talk about carbon markets, okay? First is a compliance-based market, okay? That just means that that is a state or federal regulation that says you can't emit but so much carbon into the atmosphere, after that, you're gonna have to do something about it, okay? So an example of that would be California's cap and trade program that's on sulfur. If we look across the globe, okay, across the globe, the majority of carbon programs are due to compliance-based markets, okay? But that is not currently the case here in the United States, okay? So here in the United States, <coughs> these are what are called voluntary carbon markets, okay? These are companies that are committed to some sort of sustainability pledge, okay? So what do I mean by that? Has anybody seen one of these popular press releases by companies around, right? So you've got all of these companies wanted to be greenhouse gas neutral by some time in the future, right? You see here, 2030, 2040, right? So, I always like to give the example. U.S. Airlines, okay? What is their job? Fly goods, people, and service across the globe, right? How do they do that? Aviation fuel, right? A company like that can only be so 
sustainable and only get so much on their greenhouse gas initiative. So what do they have to do to reach net zero? Not fly. <laughs> Not, fly. <laughs> Not fly, shut down, right? Well, to meet that goal, they have to go into a third party market and purchase carbon credits, okay, to offset their emissions, okay? So that's what's driving these markets, are these companies making these pledges. Now, why would a company make these pledges? They're going to start buying the credit up. They're going to start buying the credit. Yes, they are. They're going to start buying credits up, and that's what's, what's going on. They but if they think that's what consumers want. So there are two things driving these markets, okay, and making these companies commit to these voluntary pledges of greenhouse gas neutral in the future. One, it's consumers. It's us in the room, specifically also the younger generation, okay. They are demanding and they are making purchasing decisions based more and more on the environment. Okay? Environmentally conscious consumers. Okay? This is a survey done by Expedia last year. 90% of travelers are looking for a more sustainable method of travel and 60% are willing to pay more for it. That's just the travel industry, okay? This is also an example I like to give. This is when I went to book my rental car when I was in Kansas earlier this week, okay? When you go to check out, not only can you now choose a car with XM radio or choose a vehicle where you have a child seat, okay? But right here, if you can't see this in the back, this is a greenhouse gas emissions offset that you can purchase for your rental and it's a dollar 25 per rental. I'm sure you checked that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the end, you can guess whether I checked that or, or not, okay? By the end of this presentation. Dollar 25, why would they do that? This wouldn't be on their website if people weren't checking the box. Okay? It feel good. It makes them feel good as a consumer to check that box and contribute to that. Now, where do you think that dollar twenty-five is going? Okay, it's going to enterprise. Absolutely. But it's going towards their greenhouse gas pledges. Okay? So again, these wouldn't exist if people weren't paying for it, they're willing to pay for it, okay? The other thing, so consumers and then shareholders, okay? Shareholders of publicly traded companies, okay, are now requiring these companies to have some sort of greenhouse gas initiative, okay? If we look at the S&P 500 companies and how many are now having some sort of sustainability reported, we went from 20% in 2011 to probably closer to 100% now, okay? To some form of sustainability reporting. Now, what does that mean, sustainability reporting, right? There's variations across all these companies, okay? There's no standardization about what they're reporting, okay? but. They're reporting something, okay? And so what I wanna highlight here, which will wrap around at the end when we talk about some government involvement, okay? When we talk about greenhouse gas emissions in these companies, okay? They have what are called scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, okay? These are little breakdown for the food and beverage, top food and beverage companies in the United States. 
Scope 1 emissions, right here in the middle, okay, that's those company facilities or those company vehicles. So if they wanted to reduce their Scope 1 emissions, a company may adopt electric vehicles, for example, instead of running gas vehicles. That's a way that they could reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Scope 2 okay, is the energy that they use in their manufacturing process. Okay. So they could purchase wind energy instead of coal energy, for example. Okay. Now we have scope 3 emissions. Okay. Those are all the emissions from upstream and downstream activities that contribute to the overall greenhouse gas emissions of that company. Where do you all fall in if you're a farmer? You're right here in the scope three emissions. Okay. So when we look at companies like this that are pledging to be greenhouse gas neutral, they only control roughly 12% that are, that's in their direct control. All the other emissions, 88% come from upstream or downstream activities. Okay, so you can imagine when they make these pledges, it's very hard to meet their goals, generating these voluntary markets. Okay, but keep that in mind on the scope three issue. So why am I even talking to you today? Why has this even come about? Okay, why agriculture? Okay, out of our major sectors in the United States, okay, agriculture emits 11% of the greenhouse gases by industry. That number actually increased by percentage over 2019, by percentage. Okay, did we emit more carbon or greenhouse gases as an ag industry? No. Okay, but what were we doing less of in 2020? Transportation. Transportation as a whole went down, so by a percentage, something else has got to go up. Okay, so we weren't emitting more, but we do emit now 11%. I would guess when this number gets re-released, it will be back down to the 10% where it was before. Okay, so when we think about the agriculture sector, what agriculture activities release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere? Okay, the number one thing, 55%, is from ag soil management activities. So what would you guess, what practices emit greenhouse gases from an ag soil management perspective? Tillage. tillage, absolutely, absolutely, okay? So tillage is that 55%, okay? so. When we look at activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the agriculture sector, especially carbon, you've got your top four activities. Okay. Number one activity would be convert all cropland to pasture. Are we going to do that? No, we are not. Okay. Number two up there, okay, is using some form of winter cover crop, okay, and then three and four, couple of them the same thing, is converting from tillage to some form of conservation tillage or no-till, okay. So, when we think about these carbon markets that are in place, okay, all of them, okay, all of them are paying farmers to adopt either or of cover crops or 
converting to some form of conservation tillage or no-till. You follow me? Okay, those are the activities that they're paying for. Some other companies are got some ancillary um, activities going on, but for the most part, those are the activities that they're paying for. Okay. So how do these carbon markets work at a high level? Okay. Let's just say we have Shockley Farms. Okay. I get approached by what I like to call an aggregator. Okay. That is one of these companies that has a carbon program. They come into an area, let's say it's your county, and they try to sign up farmers into their carbon program. They will pay them to adopt cover crops or no-till or both. Okay, Once that is adopted, they pay you, they then own those carbon credits that are generated from you adopting those practices. Okay? And for definition purposes, one carbon credit okay, is equal to one metric ton of CO2 equivalent that's sequestered into the soil. Okay? One metric ton is equal to one carbon credit. Okay? These companies then do some form of validation to validate that these carbon credits are real. And then those companies then in turn purchase those carbon credits to offset their emissions. Okay? Now, very, there's a few cases, but not too many. Think about a company like US Air. That was an example up there, right? They're not coming to Shockley Farms and buying carbon credits directly from me. It is typically through an aggregator third party program. Okay? Now there are some examples and I'll give you a few here soon where that is the case. Okay? But for the most part that does not happen. Okay? So there are some key characteristics of these carbon markets that you need to be aware of. Okay? First, this is currently the four letter word in carbon markets. It's called additionality. Okay? What does that mean? That means that these programs want you to generate additional carbon credits and sequester additional carbon in your soil to be able to sell. So what does that mean in layman's terms? We're already doing it. Okay. If you are already doing no-till, if you are already doing cover crops, or both, you are more than likely not eligible to enroll in any of these programs. So, if you're like me, I'm from Kentucky, home of no-till. Our farmers have been doing no-till for 40, 50 years. Okay? They have sequestered their carbon for 40 or 50 years. So they can't generate additional carbon that's sequestered in the soil by doing additional practices. And so, that's been a key issue with these carbon markets because anyone here do no-till? Okay. Now, this is the, who here does cover crops? Right? So your area is unique because of the cover crop situation. Okay. You already have a mechanism in place that allows you to afford to do cover crops, right? Whereas these programs are paying for people to do cover crops where they don't have incentives in place. So if you are doing some sort of conservation tillage, min-till or something, there's an opportunity there with some of these markets potentially. Now, they will, okay, 
I'm assuming, who here does wheat cover crop? Most? Okay. Now, some of these programs will allow you to change your practice just a little bit. Let's just say wheat to a five species blend that may sequester a little bit more additional carbon in the soil and allow you to be eligible. But it depends on the company, okay? I mentioned verification, right? You can imagine if you're a US Air, Microsoft, Google, what have you, right? And you are purchasing these credits. You wanna make sure that what you're paying for is real, right? And so these credits have to be verified and the typical system, these are four major registries that are out there where these companies are going to, to purchase credits, where they're getting verified, okay? Out of all the carbon credits that are in there across the globe, 99.999% are not from agriculture. They are actually from forest-based carbon programs across the globe. Okay, you can imagine that it's a lot easier and cheaper to verify that a portion of the Amazon is still standing <laughs> rather than if Shockley Farms is still doing no-till. Okay? So, that's why that's the case right now. There, there are some companies that have put some row crop agriculture into these row crop generated carbon credits into this one of these registries, but that was just as of last year. Okay? The other one is permanence. They want these carbon credits to be stored in the soil for a very long time. Okay, so there's an issue if you as a farmer have to go and till the soil for one reason or another, right? And we will talk about that in a little bit. And finally, it's exclusive, okay? That means that that carbon credit that was generated on that one acre parcel of your property, once it's sold, once you sell it, one, it's no longer yours, and then the final buyer, let's just say it's Microsoft, okay? Microsoft has exclusive rights to that carbon credit. Microsoft and US Airlines can't own that same credit. Can't be double dipping, okay? So they're exclusive. So those are the four things, characteristics of carbon markets. Here are, are all the carbon programs that are out there currently that I know of in the United States. Okay, see some familiar names up there, right? I've seen some hats and jackets of folks' names on this list. Okay, maybe even some sponsors. Right? So, familiar names. Now, not all of these are operated in the Eastern Shore. Okay. The way a lot of these companies do, they start out with pilot projects across the U.S. in certain locations and then expand their eligibility to certain areas. Okay, So you see some names of input suppliers that you may recognize, right? But you also see some names of some interesting companies. I like to point out and give the example of Kellogg's, okay. What's Kellogg's known for? Cereal. Cereal. They're actually going directly to farmers to help them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Now what type of farmer do you think they're going to? What is that farmer growing? Corn, wheat, wheat corn, beans, what do you think it is? I'm hearing corn, I'm hearing wheat. It's actually none of those. Cows. Interesting. Not it's actually rice. Because rice is the largest greenhouse gas emitting crop we grow in the United States. And it's not carbon. It's methane because of flood irrigation and the way it's grown. 
it emits a lot of methane. Okay, so they're going to change their flooding practices and how they grow the crop to reduce that. Now, there is one up here that you may be familiar with. Okay, which one might that be? Boom. <laughs> the last one I put on my list. Okay, Purdue Agribusiness. Okay, this is also an example of where maybe a, a company will be coming directly to you as a farmer, specifically in this area. I'm not gonna ask if anyone is enrolled in Purdue's carbon program in the room. Um, if you do, please come talk to me, I'd appreciate it. But what Purdue is doing, okay, is they're actually partnering with Bayer Carbon. Bayer Carbon's the actual carbon program that they're partnering with, it is now called Foreground, okay? So it's a partnership where they're working together to enroll farmers, grain farmers, into their Bayer's carbon program to help Purdue meet their greenhouse gas goals. Okay? So I know some of people in this area. This is the second year of Purdue's pro pilot project coming out that are enrolling in that, in this area, okay? I will talk about my concerns here in a, towards the end of things we need to watch out for, okay? And what I'm seeing is trends and it scares me. We'll talk about that at the end. But again, these are all the companies that are being offered out there, okay? So keep an eye on that. And each one's completely different, folks. What they are requiring you to do to be eligible, how much they're paying, all that stuff, each one is completely different. So don't think they're the same. And we'll go into some discussions about that here in just a minute. So what are they paying? How much are they paying? Okay. So across all those companies, okay, they are paying farmers, once you adopt those practices, anywhere in the range of 15 to 25 dollars per metric ton of CO2 equivalent. What in the world does that mean? What are we used to dealing with? Dollars per what? Acre. acre. acre right? Absolutely. Dollars per acre. Now do they make that confusing for a reason? Eh, that's to be, to be determined, okay? So I pulled up this USDA NRCS Comet Planner model. This is a model that's being used by some of these companies, okay, when they go out to your farm to estimate the potential adoption of these, of these practices and how much you will sequester, okay? This is just one of the many models that are out there, okay? But I went online, easy to do, converting from no-till or converting from tillage to no-till in this area, you can sequester on average over a 10-year time frame of 0.64 metric tons per acre per year. So simple math this morning, 0.64 times these numbers, you're at the upper range of $16 an acre that they are paying. So I always ask this question. Can you convert from tillage to no-till for $16 an acre? Not even close, right? What about, just some, what if you never did cover crops before? Do you think you can plant, establish, and terminate a cover crop for around that same price? No, not even close, okay? So that's an example there. On average across the U.S., okay, the estimate is 0.31 metric tons for no-till, 0.37 for cover crops. If you're in my neck of the woods in Kentucky, we run about 0.5 metric tons. I do a lot of work with my friends at, in Texas, okay, that number is 0.1. 
I mentioned I just was just in Kansas. Some of those numbers were 0.2. Okay, so we're not talking breaking the bank here numbers. Something to be aware of. Now, I'd use the same comet tool. The average for the entire Delmarva is about 0.57 metric tons per year for no-till. Okay, so on par with Kentucky. Okay, so again, not break the bank money. So, concerns through my eyes, right? The payments and how much you're getting paid are not here yet. Okay, if I said you're getting paid to do cover crops at $15 an acre, you all would laugh at me, right? Because you're getting paid a lot more to do that already with the programs that are set in place, okay? The money's not there, so just realize that. Nor is it covering the risk, okay? As an economist, one of the things I like to think about is risk. It's one of the things we have to, right? Story I like to tell is some work I was doing in the Mississippi Delta about four years ago, working with a group of prominent farmers in the area. Okay, we were trying to do some cover crop work with them. They were adopting cover crops for the first time. Okay, had a grain farmer, he was doing it. That first year, he lost 100 bushels in corn from doing cover crops. 100 bushels. Is that payment gonna offset that? Now, whose fault was it? Well. Anybody, any guesses on why he lost that amount? It's not that he didn't get killed in time. What happened was, is that he didn't have his planter set up correctly. Didn't have the row cleaner set up correctly. Didn't get good seed to soil contact. Lost 100 bushels. He didn't get off the tractor and check. <laughs> Jenny, that's probably correct. Or, or he, My dad told me Yes. So, again, there are risks associated. Same thing with converting to no-till, right? For those that have converted to no-till, is there an initial yield drag? Same with cover crops. There is an initial yield drag. These programs currently do not cover that. That's loss of income on your cash crop. Now, I will say that I am happy to hear there are discussions from some of these companies that they will be underwriting any yield drag, basically providing insurance for you of any yield loss. Now, that's in pilot stage as well now, too, okay? But at least they know that they have to do this to encourage more adoption, okay? Concept of additionality, again, especially in my neck of the woods and here, right? Why are we punishing producers for doing the right thing, right? In Kentucky, we've been doing it for a different reason, right? We have cover crops and no-till because we have erosion control problems, okay? And we've been doing stuff for 40 years. Why penalize us? Now, I think there's ways around this, and part of my job has been promoting ways to include everyone in this room and change the concept of this term additionality to include you all in these programs. Okay? There is precedence actually in the timber industry where they pay folks not to harvest one-year contracts. How about if I paid you not to till for a year? Right? There's precedence there. So we're trying to change the dialogue. Contracts. Paul, you know this just as well as I do. Okay? Yes. Yes. So get ready. So if... if um, if you all are considering a carbon contract, please see Paul. <laughs> That'll be my pitch at the end for the ag lawyer, okay? Contracts. I've mentioned every one of these companies are different. 
The contract lengths are different, terminology is different, what they're paying for is different, on and on and on and on. And we'll go through a couple of those here real quick. Again, enrollment length varies. I know one that's a 100-year contract. Okay, on average it's 10. So you're signing a 10-year contract. Eligible locations will vary. Again, I mentioned this pilot project and how they are expanding into certain areas. You would think that because of the good sustainable practices that you are currently doing is probably why they haven't flooded here yet. Okay? But I anticipate as things develop down the road, they'll all be in this area. Some have minimal acres to enroll. Okay? So maybe it says $1,000 or 1,000 acres to enroll. Okay? Some have zero minimal acre requirements. Some not only want you to enroll the farm, they want you to enroll the homestead as well and the acres that that sits on. Okay? The payment amount, structure, and timing will vary. I mentioned that range already of $15 to $25 per metric ton. Some companies like Bayer pay you on a per acre basis for practice only. There, okay. Some pay you across time. So let's just say it was at $16 an acre. They pay you 50% in year run, 25% in year two, 25% in year three. Okay, and it's a rolling, rolling payment. I mentioned some pay you in dollars per acre, per metric ton. Some pay you in cryptocurrency. <laughs> okay. And not even one like that is popular in the news. It's one that they made up. And I'm, I'm not kidding. It's, it's, it's crazy. Okay. And it's not from that NTX guy that's now in jail. Okay. <laughs> They typically don't want to pay for additional costs, so additional machinery. Um, some are starting to offer discounts through partnered companies to make that burden a little less on you, but they typically don't pay for that. Land ownership change has been a big one. Okay, I'm fielding a lot of calls, especially at our local um, Frankfurt, at our politicians, okay, on this issue. Right now, the majority, if not all, of the carbon contracts are tied to the land owner, not the land. Okay? There's a lot of discussion going on right now on should land, should these carbon contracts be divulged <coughs> when sales are happening, right? Public record. Right now, I said that's kind of pointless to have this debate, but not saying that that won't change in the future when the verbiage and contracts change. Okay, so they're trying to proactively put this in place. Repayment for non-compliance with terms of contracts. What do you do if you have a herbicide resistant weed? And you may have to till. That will be a breach of contract. So typically what happens is you will have to repay that amount that you got paid for doing practice. What happens if you have a dry fall and you can't get that cover crop established? Right? What happens then? You got to repay it. Okay. Most of these companies require some form of advanced precision ag technology data recording. So if you're not comfortable with that level of technology, okay, these carbon programs are not, probably not going to be for you because it goes back to that verification point, right? They want to know what you're doing and what you've been doing on your farm and all the practices that are involved, okay? They also require, some of them, drone access, so aerial imagery of your farm. So they have open access to fly over your property. Okay. What about stacking other conservation programs? Okay. 
stacking other conservation programs. So let's just say that payment you're getting for your cover crops, can you do that too? Enroll in that, start doing cover crops, and then also enroll in a carbon program at the same time. Good extension issue. It depends on the company, <laughs> okay? But however, most of them know, especially like Equip money, okay? Because it goes back to the exclusive nature of carbon credits. If you're getting paid from USDA for doing these programs that are sequestering carbon, and then you've got this carbon program over here, who actually owns that carbon credit? Right? There's a, there's a tension there, because they want sole ownership of that carbon credit. Now, what's also interesting is some of the verbiage in these contracts say, you cannot take any federal payments. That not only excludes EQIP, it excludes crop insurance. Yeah, I got your attention there, didn't I? <laughs> Typically do. Okay, that's not all these companies, but some of them have that broad verbiage. And you can probably imagine that those companies don't really know agriculture. Okay, and how we operate. What about ownership of other ecosystems credits? What do I mean by ecosystem service credits? Okay, we've been talking about carbon credits all morning. Okay, but we all know that no till and cover crops do other things, benefits of soil and water, right? You wouldn't be paid to do cover crops. That wasn't the case, right? Think about water quality, water quantity. There are other programs out there, credits, that are being discussed. Water quality, water quantity, net greenhouse gas credits, nutrient reduction credits. Some of these companies if you sign up with them for a carbon credit, they have the rights to any of those going forward. Okay? They have the rights to any of those going forward. So keep that in the back of your mind. So as I mentioned, I've given this talk quite a bit, and so I always like to share the questions that I get from farmers, okay, to kind of heat off any that I may get <laughs> in the room this morning, okay? The first question is always number one. Will this go away with an administration change? Okay. Will this go away with an administration change? If you remember my first or second slide, what's driving these markets? <coughs> Did I say government at all? It's 100% consumer and stakeholders. Okay. The answer to that is no. Most of those companies are also global businesses that are making decisions at a global scale. It has nothing to do with administration. Okay, so this is here to stay, folks. Okay, is this all just feel-good crap? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a. Now, I will say that there are companies out there that do have valiant greenhouse gas efforts and initiatives, okay, that do value the environment. There's no doubt about that. But I can also tell you there's an entire other sector that is strictly using this for marketing and marketing purposes, right? I'm not saying enterprises that way, but if I were to click, it's about feeling good for myself, right? It's not to feel good for enterprise. Okay, so yes, there are a lot of these folks that are using this for marketing purposes. Okay, can I shoot the drones down? <laughs> okay, as I mentioned, I do a lot of my, do a lot of work with colleagues in Texas, as you know. You know we, we, no, you can't shoot the drones down. Why? 
Why can't you shoot drones down, Paul? It's illegal. It's illegal. <laughs> right? It's, it's someone else's property and you sign the contract that says that they can fly over your property. So no, you can't shoot them down. Okay? Why am I not eligible sounds like the right, not the right time for us. Okay? And that goes back to that additionality concept, right? And most farmers are now realizing that they may or may not be eligible and then the price that they are currently paying does not pay not only for the practice but the headache, that the paperwork to do it. Okay? Can I break out the plow and be eligible? <laughs> okay? The answer to this is twofold. Yes and no. Okay? Yes as in you have to do it for at least five years. Most of these companies have a look back period of five years to look at what practices you are doing, okay, to provide a baseline to estimate how much carbon you're already sequestering to then say if you make that change, how much additional carbon would you sequester? Okay, so yes, you can do it, but it's got to be for five years. What margins are for the aggregators and how much are they selling these credits for? Okay. I do not know how much they're selling the carbon credits for. Okay? I like to equate it to packer margins. Okay? The elusive packer margin issue that my friends in the livestock industry like to discuss all the time. I don't know. But what I do know is I wouldn't have to be adding names to that list of programs on a monthly basis if there wasn't money to be had. Right? And who typically gets the short end of the stick? Okay. Will prices for carbon credits increase in the future? Okay. My answer to that is they better and I think they will. Okay. What will they get to? Um, the World Bank has it estimated it at $80 to $100 per metric ton by 2030. So let me do some simple math this morning because I haven't had enough coffee, <laughs> even though I'm an economist, right? If you can sequester 0.5 metric tons for whatever practice you're doing, does $40 to $50 an acre work for you? Can you plant established cover crops for $50 an acre? I think so. Now I think we're talking, we're in the ballpark now. It's not $16 an acre. Okay, and if you, if you also got to think, when were those pledges in the future for these companies? 2030, 2040, 2050, okay? If they keep these voluntary pledges, okay, the demand is going to increase by these companies in the future. I think it's 2023, right? COVID kind of threw us all off on what time frame it is, but we're still a far ways out for some of these companies to figure this out. Okay? So I think they will increase in the future. Why should I give up my ownership of my carbon credits? This is now starting to become a big one. Okay? Because once you sell them, they're no longer yours. Okay? I equate this to the data boom, right? Sell my data, get paid for it. Then again, it's my data, right? Why would I sell it? Okay. So there's questions and concerns about once you give that away, because how, what happens if something comes down, and we'll talk about this in a minute, where they say, you've got to prove that you're doing sustainability practices and you're sequestering carbon. Well, what happens if you already sold those carbon credits? Right? They're gone. Are there carbon programs for livestock, timber, solar, Okay, the quick answer to this is yes, yes, no. And yes, livestock, yes, timber, no on solar. Okay, so if you want to talk more, I'll be around all morning on those other programs. Be happy to talk to you on that. Will the government have their hands in these carbon markets? I know we're close to DC, um, so I better be quiet. No. Um, the answer to this question about six months ago was no. 
but <laughs> things have evolved, right? Things have evolved. Specifically when it comes to the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Okay, that got pushed through in late December where um, I actually, weirdly enough, don't think it went far enough with these carbon programs. And what do I mean by that? Well, this was a bipartisan um, bill that went through and basically what they're doing is they're setting up a registration list for technical advisors and credit verifiers. So they're saying, okay, if these people are on this list, they're okay with us. Okay. They create this advisory council. They will meet program standards. But what I was wanting to see was a USDA certified carbon credit. And that was in the original, original bill there. That got pared back. And why is that? Why do I say that? Every one of those companies is doing something different for verification. There's a different methodology. Some even, some of my soil science colleagues even question if you can actually measure this stuff or not. Right, I see some heads shaking. Okay. And you can measure this accurately, period. Not what methods you're using. Is it even, given the dynamics of soil, is it even possible? Okay. So everyone's on a different playing field. Some are not even verifying. Okay. So again, I would l I love to have seen a USDA certified where the USDA would come in and say, okay, these are the standards that everyone's going to play with. This is the exact same measurement technique we're going to use so everyone's on the same playing field. Okay. It fell short of that. This is the other big one that we really need to be aware of. Okay. SEC, Security and Exchange Commission. Okay. They are saying that if you are a publicly traded company and you are reporting greenhouse gas reductions in your sustainability reporting to investors to invest in, right? You have to prove it. It's kind of novel, isn't it? You have to prove it. So what does that mean? Why should you be worried? Well, goes back to the scope one, scope two, scope three reductions. If those companies are claiming scope three reductions, you all have to prove it. Carbon program or no carbon program, you all have to prove it. Where do you think the cost comes from? You all bear the cost of it. Again, regardless if you are enrolled in a carbon program or not. Okay, now, all of our commodity organizations, Farm Bureau, everyone is very well aware of this going on right now and the discussions are getting passed through, trying to get this passed through. Okay, so I'm hoping this will fail. Okay, because it's not good for those here in the room. Okay, and so, Keep your eye on this because, um, again, I think this is an important issue that we need to try to avoid. So, to wrap things up, markets continue to develop under these voluntary commitments with limited government intervention. New programs will continue to launch, right? I'll be adding that list on a monthly basis, both for row crop producers, woodland owners, and farmers and ranchers. We need to address these contract issues, okay? along with higher prices. Additionality, again, I'm trying my best to steer the conversation on that. Keep your eye on federal involvement with the SEC and commodity futures trading and what USDA plans to do. This is, I mentioned halfway through the presentation about something I'm really worried about, right? Really concerns me. It's this one right here. Can anybody see that? This is saying, keep an eye on direct buyers of grain. Okay. I'm going to give an example. This is not happening. Okay, so don't be worried. What if Purdue, agribusiness, 
told you all we're not buying your grain unless you do these X, Y, and Z practices. Do you think that can happen? Raise your hand if you can. <laughs> okay. Let me give you an example. Okay. Quick history. What's Kentucky known for? Bourbon. Whiskey. Absolutely. What's the other one? Horses. Horses, Horses and bourbon. Good, good job this morning, right? Did you bring us any bourbon? I couldn't pack it. Oh. <laughs> I was carry on because I had a short layover. They wouldn't let me through the, let me through the grape, but I would have. I would have. Major buyer of grain in Kentucky is bourbon, the bourbon industry. We currently have one major bourbon company, okay, that has now told farmers, you must adopt sustainable practices on your farming operation, which means cover crops, no-till, Okay, and you have to reduce your nitrogen percentage by an extraordinary amount. My initial <coughs> hearing of this, I don't know if it's true or not, but some numbers floating out there are 80%. Oh, wow. That's my reaction. <laughs> this came to my attention about nah, six weeks ago. This decision was made in a boardroom overseas. <laughs> Folks, it's not the government you need to be worried about. It's this disconnect from agriculture to those in the boardroom. That scares me. Okay. And they're saying, we're not buying your corn crop. Luckily for us, we have diversified markets that we could sell our corn to. Okay? We've got Purdue, we've got Tyson, we've got major grain elevators, ADM, Bungie, Cargill. Now, we may have to travel about 50 more miles one way to deliver that grain rather than to the bourbon industry and take on a little bit cost, but we've got markets. Okay. If a poultry company, you know, we're, we grow a lot of chickens too, right? One in every four rows of corn in Kentucky goes to the poultry industry, goes to chickens, okay? We're number seventh in the U.S. in poultry production, okay? If one of those companies said we're not gonna buy your corn unless you do X, Y, and Z, there are certain areas of the state where we're gonna be in trouble. And I'm sure that's the problem here too, right? If you couldn't deliver to Purdue, how much farther you gotta go? Right? So, there are discussions. There is precedent, and what the problem is, is with the, with the bourbon example, this is the largest buyer largest bourbon producer in the state. They want to do, be the first one to do it so that everyone else follows. You follow me here? The question there is how are they going to get that product in all those restrictions? I think that, so the, so the question is how are they going to get their product with all that restrictions? Right? Well, this is a very large company. They will just expand their radius pay a little bit more in freight and take it out of Ohio in the end. They'll find it eventually. So if they restrict nitrogen that much, it could be hard to find it. You're absolutely right on that one. So I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a rude awakening and hopefully a upheaval by those of us in the room if that ever happened. And to say, okay, well, good luck producing your product. Because you ain't getting it from us no more. Which I think is what's going to happen. But again, these are external forces that we're dealing with, folks, that are scary. 
okay, that are scary. So be aware of that on what's going on. Finally, if you are ever considering a carbon program, I'm not saying some of these are good programs, I'm sure, okay? Some eventually may be paying a lot more, okay? But read the fine print of these contracts. Devil's in the details, right? And where are the details typically at in these, Paul? In the fine print and in the appendix, right? Don't be getting approached, and I've heard this story many a times, don't be getting approached, how do we typically like to handle contracts, right? You put it down on the desk, you look at the first number, you flip it over and sign it. One, that number that you're looking at may have a different payment structure on it, right? So don't think it's automatically a per acre payment, okay? Just be wary, read the fine print, ask questions. Ask questions about what you have to do to qualify for these programs. How the payments are structured, what you're gonna get paid. What happens if prices do go up? Is there a mechanism in place to adjust for increased prices in the future? Don't be stuck at $15 an acre when your neighbor's now making 50. All right, we've seen that before. Okay? And then seek legal advice, please. These contracts, we've looked at them. I'm not a legal specialist, Paul is, and they're complicated, right? These things are crazy complicated. So please, if you're considering that, seek legal advice, specifically an ag lawyer. But even to those folks, it's, it's, can, the terminology can get confusing, okay? So with that, I appreciate your time. We're a little bit, almost. Any questions that I haven't answered already? Yes, sir. I have one for you. Yep. So American Airlines, which yep. you talked about in the beginning, is purchasing all these carbon credits to get their carbon down to zero, right? They're still dumping fuel in the atmosphere, polluting everything. Yeah. So what difference does it make how many carbon credits they buy? That's a, that's a very good point, right? So they're still polluting, and they could just technically continue to pollute and just continue to buy offsets, okay? Or buy more ethanol. So the way that these are intended to do, these markets, these carbon markets, and these companies is to be a stopgap or a bridge for them to do R&D to reduce in-house their own dumping or emissions and get to where engines that can handle more sustainable jet fuel, for example, okay? So these give them time to make those decisions. Now, will every company do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Why don't we, Jordan, just start our own co-op and buy their car? So, absolutely fantastic question. The question was, what if we just start our own co-op? I think that's a great idea. And if they're willing to come in here, you've got power and numbers. I think that those companies won't like that, but that is a very good option. I'm pushing back. Yeah. Because what's coming down the line scares me. And if you can be in a co-op fashion and have everyone on board to say, no, we're not, not going to supply you, then maybe some of these changes won't come. Absolutely. Any other last minute, last minute questions? Again, I'll be around. Oh, yes, sir. When are we going to go into a reality economy rather than abstract? <laughs> when are we going to? You might talk to them about that later. That, yeah, let's address that one. But let's address that one later. Yeah. But we're living, yes, we are living in an abstract world right now. But again, Real quick, 
This abstract world is because, in my opinion, consumers don't, are not educated enough. The disconnect from where their food comes from to you all is substantial. Now, whose fault is that? I say it's both, and I'm going to be straight honest with you. You all need to be advocating on your behalf. Tell your story. A lot of this sustainability stuff that we're doing in Kentucky is to help farmers tell their story okay, to the public, to educate them. You would think that coming after, out of COVID, folks would realize that their food just doesn't come from the grocery store, right? And there's a lot of direct marketing, farm table, buying from farmers, but it's still just as bad, okay? So I encourage advocating on all ends, okay? Thank you. Thank you.